Okay, so I finally went down this rabbit hole that is color analysis. You guys already know I had to go get my personal color analysis. Like, I was not leaving Korea without doing that. I studied color analysis in high school, and here are my tips for- I got professionally color analyzed, and I have regrets. And I came back out the other side relatively unscathed. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically using color systems to look and feel better. And that sounds relatively simple, right? Well, it is and it isn't. It really isn't. Because I would always go into the comment sections of these videos and there was always so much confusion, so much disarray. No one seemed to agree on anything. So I usually just left feeling confused and I forgot about it for a while. The more I started thinking about it, the more it started to make sense because, well, color is really, really important. I saw a Twitter thread about color psychology and how much it can influence people's perception of you. And I realized that that was true. And then the more I thought about it, the more I started to notice things. I noticed that some colors actually just looked a lot worse or a lot better on me. And I didn't understand why. So I wanted to both be able to wield this power and also just be able to figure out what's going on. So I decided to start thinking about it from an analytical perspective. Why not think about it as a puzzle to piece together? Basically distill it down into the most fundamental principles, the most you know fundamental building blocks and see what comes out of it. So I decided to take a stab at it and this is what I found. By the way, this is my first video and I'm kind of nervous to publish this, so please be nice. So this isn't exactly a principle, but I have to say it because it's important. And it's just that color is really, really complex, probably more than you realize. Because I went down all this, like this whole rabbit hole, read through all this theory, and I realized that there are so many debates that are still open, a lot of topics that we will probably never get consensus on, and so many ways to look at things. Like, for example, let me ask you this. Is yellow a primary color? The answer is yes, kind of. Well, it depends because it is a primary color in the red, yellow, blue color system that we use in painting, but it isn't in the red, green, blue color system that your computer uses for lighting. And it is in the cyan, magenta, yellow, black color system that we use in printing. And those are only three of the color systems that are out there. There are so many more. And I think it's because reality itself is complex. We're all just looking at these colors through our eyes and trying to make sense of them and convert them into numbers and into equations. And it doesn't always work out really simply. However, the good news is that most of these differences are over details more than anything. And there is still a lot that you can take away from all this. So let's focus on that. First thing is that the more saturated something is, the more eye catching it is. So that's why when you look at something like this, the first thing you're gonna look at is the little girl. Second, the more contrasted something is, again, the more eye-catching it is. That's probably why your eyes went here, rather than somewhere like here. Next, colors exist in spectrums. So for example, this is the most widely used color wheel. And where is blue exactly? Because blue isn't just blue. What you don't know is that that sweater is not just blue. It's not turquoise, it's not lapis, it's actually cerulean. There is a whole range of colors that we generally accept as being blue. So if you start adding yellow, for, for example, it starts to get warmer and it starts to get greener. And if you don't add yellow, then it stays cool. And that's pretty important to note. Basically, blue is considered the coolest color. And where exactly that point of being coolest is could be in contention, but it's going to be roughly around here. And so the warmest is going to be on the other side of that, roughly around here. Lastly, colors are relative. So you've probably seen this before. Basically, the twist is that both boxes are the exact same color. The left one just looks darker because it's surrounded by lighter colors and vice versa. And the same thing applies to people too. So these two women are wearing the same exact lipstick color, but one just looks darker on one person because she has lighter skin and the other one looks lighter because, well, she has darker skin. It's basically the same thing as the gray boxes. 
So at this point, you might be thinking, where is all of this going? Where is all the color seasons, the swatches on all of that? And trust me, I am getting there. It's all tying together. Think about it. What happens in the summer when you get a tan? Your teeth look whiter, right? Similarly, if you have really cool skin and you wear something really, really warm, you could look kind of pale and sickly. And if you have really blended or muted features and you wear something really, really like vibrant, let's say, you could run the risk at looking kind of invisible because the outfit is kind of distracting. And that's what I learned is the main point of all of this, because I think that you can wear any color that you want and the world is going to keep spinning but your best colors will be the ones that both make you look good and put you in focus, so ideally you feel more confident. And that's how I ended up using this theory to update my profile picture on Twitter, because I realized that people only scroll past your picture for maybe a couple of seconds at a time, and ideally you want a picture that is both eye-catching and puts you in focus. I think that's a big lesson for personal branding if that's something that you are interested in. Because I've seen a lot of pictures with really, really bright backgrounds, but the face is all washed out and you can barely make out their features, so it feels kind of counterproductive. And when I started thinking about it through this lens, it all started to kind of tie together about how I could actually use this. And going back to the puzzle analogy, it's kind of like being able to put the puzzle pieces into groups and then you kind of see where all the pieces might go and you start to see the picture emerge, let's say. Okay, let's start putting it together. So we have cool to warm features, and then we have muted to intense features. And yes, red is a neutral color. If we go back to the color wheel, we can see that it ranges from cooler to warmer, but overall it is in the middle between blue and yellow. Winter is cool and intense. Spring is warm and intense. Summer is cool and muted. And autumn is warm and muted. And again, this is all more to do with what is harmonious with you more than anything. So if you have the right features, you can wear something really bright and vibrant, and it looks pretty natural and almost effortless. And otherwise, it just has a different effect, and that's just something to be aware of. By the way, I don't want to make a sound like muted is bad and bright and contrasted is good, because some of the most beautiful and handsome people in the world have muted features. It's just that muted colors bring out their features better than bright and contrasted colors. That's the only difference. Okay, now let's dig a little bit deeper. There is this often vague and kind of misunderstood concept of overtones and undertones, but I think it's pretty important to understand if you're trying to apply all of this to human skin. Remember how I said that blue isn't just blue? Well, that's just because there's many different shades and tones of blue. So sticking with the analogy, blue is the overtone, it's the color that you actually notice. But this is a cool blue and this is a warm blue. They are just different undertones of blue. So funny enough, that means that you can have a cool overtone and still have a warm undertone and vice versa. But no one has blue skin anyways, so let's shift focus. I was looking at different color spaces and different color systems and I noticed something interesting. The human skin range lies in this tiny little range between red and green. And if you zoom in a little bit closer, you notice something interesting. You can add a little bit of black or white and get different shades or add some blue or yellow to get different undertones. And if you stare at this long enough, then you might start to notice the boundaries of where human skin tone lies and the boundaries between cool and warm. And if you stare at that a little longer, you might notice a little something like this. Do you notice the difference between the two sides? For lighter skin tones, cool skin might look kind of pinky and warm skin might look kind of peachy. And as you get darker skin tones, you'll start to notice that cool skin looks a little bit more chocolatey and warm skin looks a little bit more caramelly. That's just a rule of thumb though, so don't take that as gospel. Okay, so warm and cool understood, hopefully. But next I asked myself, what exactly is the difference between intense and muted? That part was a bit more complicated. That's where the rabbit hole became another rabbit hole inside the rabbit hole. That part took me forever to unravel. It was kind of like trying to catch a cloud and pin it down. Here's what I mean. Between these two, who has more muted features? Yes, of course, it is Jennifer Aniston, and that becomes even more clear when you look at this picture in grayscale. It's called value, which is basically how much black and white is left when you remove all of the color. And you can see that the values in her face and her hair are almost the same. 
Her features are just more blended compared to the other side. So does that mean that you need light skin and dark hair in order to wear bright colors or vice versa? Well, no. So take Onokiai for example, she has really dark skin and dark hair, but she is considered a winter, so why is that? Here's the interesting thing with contrast. If you have dark skin, it contrasts with the whites in your eyes, your teeth, and the highlights and shiny parts of your face. And if you have really light skin, it contrasts with your hair, brows, and shadows of your face, especially if you have this kind of bone structure. You can kind of see it when you look at the histogram of light to dark values in this image. Inok has more dark tones, but not as many mid-tones. Side note, but look at the difference here. Same thing when you go back to compare with Eva. If you look at the histogram, you can see that Jennifer has way more mid-tones and a lot less very dark and very light tones. So contrast and mid-tones, that's one part of the puzzle, but then I realized that there's a whole another half to this equation. Let's bring back this comparison. What exactly is the difference here? They both have similar-ish grayscale profiles. They are both warm, but if you look more closely, you can see that Blake just has more color in her face than Gigi. The keyword here is saturation. Different systems define saturation differently, but in general, it means purity of a color. And if we go back to the color wheel again, we can see that these are all of the different hues. That means basically all of the different colors at their purest. And when you start adding black and white, specifically gray, it becomes less saturated. And you can see that the average color saturation on the left is 70% and on the right, it's 14%. It just means that she has more gray in her skin tone. And if you add gray that has the same value, then it doesn't even change in the grayscale image, but it does become more dull in any definition of saturation. So more saturation allows for more saturation and more contrast allows for more brightness. Basically, it looks like this. So more gray, more muted, and less gray, more intense. Intensity is just a combination of saturation and brightness. Cool, but why exactly is saturation different than brightness in the first place? Well, I'm glad you asked. Basically, for something to be light, bright, and saturated are three different things, which is kind of crazy. So for example, let's look at these two blues because they're both at 100% brightness and saturation. However, one is clearly deeper than the other. And that's just because brightness is about intensity, not purity or lightness. If you look at the color wheel, you can see that some colors are just more deep than others. Think about a light bulb at full brightness changing colors. The amount of light itself in the room changes as the color changes. I think that's why there's this idea that winter has to be deep and spring has to be light. But I found that there is actually a variety of light to deep in each season. It's basically a whole third axis. Thanks for sticking with me so far. Now let's put this together again. Basically so far we have bright and dark and bright and light. And you can make them both less saturated. Notice that they're both on the cool side though. So here's warmer versions of them. And of course all of these so far are bright. So let's add a dark version too. And these are basically all of the different combinations you can get. It's kind of insane how visible the differences actually are. This is basically like my version of the 12 Stuff Seasons, if you've heard of those. But don't forget that any color can have cool or warm versions as well. So take a green, for example, or red. And that's basically how you come up with color palettes. But I think it's most useful to look at the different types of color and figure out what's most important for you individually. That's basically what I did. I just went through my closet and tried out all the different combinations of color, ranked the importance of each facet, and then ordered the 12 different types. At that point, it made a lot of sense why the bright, deep, coolish red suited me a lot better than the pale, bright yellow. They're basically opposites. So I found that for me, the most important were deep, bright, saturated, and cool in that specific order. And then I made a profile picture with this knowledge. Basically, I stuck with red and added blue, took a nice picture, made a cutout and added a blue background, added a halo, um, the edges look kind of weird, so let's fix that, and color correct. Note that the dress was actually blue in real life, so let's color correct again. And that was it. I got some really nice comments about this picture, although people also told me that I gave air hostess vibes, or that I looked like I was from fans, but I'll take it. So that is it. Thank you so much for watching until the end. I had such a great time making this video and actually a horrible time as well because I did not realize how much work, um, how much editing, how many takes this would take. But now that I'm at the end, I will have to say I think it was all worth it. And I'm so excited to put this out into the world and hopefully at least some people will watch it and get some value from it.
have a nice day and leave some comments if you have any questions. Also, I should probably get a new microphone because I did not like that audio, but I don't know if I'm just being nitpicky. Let me know guys what you think about the audio and just the video in general. Okay, bye for real now.